we're going to be thinking about some other chapters in James this morning. We're carrying on thinking about our words, and we're going to think about uh, not just how we listen, uh, but how we speak as well. The clip I was going to show you was from Brave. I don't know how many of you have seen that film with children, daughters especially. Yeah, it's a fun film. Um, it's, not, it's not amazing, but the major part of it is a conflict between mother and daughter. And the clip I was going to show you was a, a crisis moment where mother and daughter are arguing about an arranged marriage that uh, the, the father and mother have planned and the daughter is uh, utterly at odds about. And in the clip, both shout, uh, neither of them listen, and both say hurtful uh, things which... Uh, lead to all kinds of adventures and end up with reconciliation. So a good Disney movie. Um, there are so many other films that I could have chosen clips from, though, because every drama includes conflict, doesn't it? If you have a story, if you have a play, if you have a film, you have to have conflict in it for, to make a narrative. Um, and yesterday, we, in, in Disney, the conflicts end up in great resolution, Often in our lives, it's not quite the same. But yet, sometimes conflict can produce good. Uh, Yesterday, we thought about how quickly words fly out, which we wish we could recapture or erase. Um, So it's no wonder that James calls us to speak slowly. So that's what we're thinking about today. It's my heading, speak slowly. Um, I shouldn't actually, I should be on the other slide before we get to dangerous words. Uh, Now, I teach, I'm just a supply teacher at the moment, Uh, But in the educational sector, we privilege loud people. We privilege fast talkers. I teach English. An English GCSE, children have to speak up in the classroom. There's no marks in the listening and speaking sector for the children who sit back and don't say anything and just listen carefully. Children have to join a group discussion. And when it's parents' evening, if the teacher says, your child's very quiet, it's not positive thing it's a negative thing and that's a shame for all of those kids who are naturally quiet but as a teacher I'm desperate to get them talking because I need proof of what they're thinking in business world as well people are encouraged to push forward to push themselves forward we see programs like the apprentice and dragon's den which are probably not very realistic at all but yet the model of the pushy, the arrogant, the vocal uh, person is rewarded and the quiet, reflective person is penalised. And then we have social media. Having teenagers, I kind of still feel like I'm lagging behind, but I'm shocked to see how rapid interaction is. With texting, texts fly back and forth. Things are said that maybe wouldn't have been said in a face-to-face conversation. Uh, Words are rapidly churned out. And the words that we might have used very, very slowly and reluctant, words like I love you, are shot out in a second. And they've come to mean different things. Conversations are signed off, love you, between friends who've not known each other for very long. So words are changed because of how fast people communicate. And we're quick to communicate with ourselves at the centre, to praise ourselves and to condemn others. Uh, And though James was writing in a massively different context, he had uh, the same problem. That's why he tells people to listen quickly, as we saw yesterday, and to uh, speak slowly. I'm going to read different sections of uh, James now, so uh, if you have to bear with me, I'm going to jump about. But starting... uh, In chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this 
to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And then uh, going on to chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Uh, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold (laughs) ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is, not the, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it isn't accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Uh, Then we're going to uh, jump to uh, chapter 3 and uh, read a section before we move on to chapter 4. So chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly... We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. We'll take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts... Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. We won't go on to chapter four just now because I think I've read plenty. (laughs) That's a lot of sections. So what was the biggest problem that these half-hearted, the double-minded Christians we talked about yesterday had? James moves from one sin to another and then back to the first. But through all those sections and through others, um, he identifies the tongue as the location of sin. 
in chapter 2, we saw favouritism, where the rich were being privileged and the poor were being uh, discriminated against. And the words that were spoken were what betrayed that discrimination. The words were being used to criticise or to put down the poor and to elevate the rich. It's kind of a form of flattery, really. Uh, There's hypocrisy as well, empty promises. Uh, Again, in in chapter 2, people saying, oh, well, I'll do, you know, wish it well, but not doing anything about it. Again, a sin of the tongue. We've got uh, quarrels and boasting in chapter 4, grumbling and making uh, vows, swearing by other things in chapter 5. All of these sins are sins of the tongue. Uh, James is close to the bone, isn't he? Because in our lives, we, we sin most often by speaking. And actually, this, this is something that's so soaked in, in Proverbs, particularly in the Old Testament. Uh, books, uh, James seems to be saturated with Proverbs. And throughout Proverbs, the danger of the tongue is highlighted. We've got uh, the woman at the beginning of, of uh, James, the folly or the prostitute, enticing with words. We've got the nagging wife, we've got the boaster. Uh, just, I mean, I could have picked out loads of different proverbs about uh, words of the tongue. Uh, proverbs twelve eighteen: the words of the reckless pierce like swords. Uh, verse 22 in the same chapter, the Lord detests lying lips. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. Words are our most common form of action, and a tasker is quoted in... Um, Matthias commentary said words are works that kind of ties in with something that linguists talk about talk about speech acts when we speak we're acting in a way we're doing something our speaks words are effective we enact our desires and our wishes through our words and these what a lot of these sins have in common are these sins of words is that they're, they're lies when we don't say what is true, so when we flatter somebody, and when we speak hypocritically, when we slander somebody, when we grumble, uh, when we uh, argue with somebody, all of those sins that are mentioned in James, they're actually all forms of lies, aren't they? When we move away from the God of truth, we start uh, to lie, and our words become lies. They don't correspond with God's reality. We talked about yesterday about how the battle of words is about a battle of sovereignty. But when we're denying the sovereignty of God in our lives and in our hearts, our words are denying the sovereignty of God, and so we're lying. There's a T-shirt over there that said, the devil is a liar. And when we speak sinful words, we're lying. It doesn't feel like outright lies, but actually they are lies, aren't they? They're lacking integrity, lacking in truthfulness. And um, James calls us away from that doubled-mindedness, that lying in our minds and lying in our mouths. Uh, maybe these, the sins that are listed here feel quite alien. We don't have extremely wealthy people and extremely poor people in our congregation. We don't uh, discriminate between them. Uh, but maybe... Uh, at a toddler group or an evangelistic event, it's more, you think, well, there's that person looks quite together. They would be a great, it would be fantastic. It's easier to see them getting converted. We maybe sidle up and talk more to the person who looks like they've got more going for them than the person who turns up disheveled and um, looking like they've got a, a chaotic life. It's the same kind of sin. Maybe we've uh, spoken about our own godly habits or taught others and gone away and indulged in this very sin that we've condemned. That's the hypocrisy that James is talking about. Um, maybe we've talked on on and on about ourselves, about our plans. That's the boasting James talks about. We've criticised a church member, maybe just in uh, asking for prayer for somebody, uh, but implicitly criticising them. Uh, that's slander, isn't it? And then complaining. We can all think of plenty of examples about complaining. But then in... uh, I want to go back and fix on a verse now. In uh, chapter 1, these famous verses, we looked at uh, a bit yesterday, but going back and think about speech, uh, verse 20, uh, 19 and 20, James links speaking fast with anger. 
So we're going to think about the unproductive words that anger brings about. When we shoot our mouths off because we're angry, uh, we don't normally engage our brains or our conscience. We give free rein to our anger. And sometimes it feels, feels to me when I'm in that situation as if by starting talking, I get on a roller coaster when it's very hard to stop. And one hurtful thing follows another. It's as if almost we become drunk in our own words. We can drum on our own perspective and uh, things get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what uh, James is talking about. Our anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Angry words are unproductive words. Maybe we want to confront somebody, a child, somebody at church, because they've done something wrong. And maybe that is a situation where it's right for us to feel upset, aggrieved. Uh, Maybe we're in in a position of authority. It's right to tackle that. But because we're giving into our anger... Actually, we have unproductive conversations. We don't, it doesn't bring out the righteous life in our own lives or in the person we're talking for. We, say, we think we're saying the right thing, but we become blind and our words multiply and our blindness multiplies. And what James starts in that chapter saying, he carries on in chapter 3. Um, he talks, so the angry tongue doesn't bring about the righteous life. He says in chapter 1. In chapter 3, he becomes even more strong, not just saying he doesn't righteous, but what does he see in in verse 6 and 8 in chapter 3? He talks about fire and hell and poison and restless evil. So not only does it not bring out righteousness, it brings out all these hideous uh, realities instead. So the tongue is a weapon, just like in Proverbs. It's a weapon and it's a dangerous weapon. In, in Proverbs, the metaphors of the tongue are often to do uh, with knives or swords. Uh, with, they're with weapons. Words become weapons. And if we contrast that very briefly, think about what the word of God is described as a double-edged sword, but a sword that is wielded by the master uh, brings about uh, righteousness. When we use our tongues wrongly, that weapon produces unrighteousness Uh, and uh, we're going to move on now to uh, think about the section of chapter 3 of taming the tongue so taming the tongue Uh, James uses several images in this section to make his point I have a, a niece who is a a very good rider. She does dressage. I don't know if you'll know what dressage is. It's kind of like ballet on horses. It's, it's a bit weird, really, thing to do, but to ride a horse and make it do different things and cross over. And, uh, and I mean, James is talking about, about horses now, but when I see my niece do dressage, it's the tiniest, tiniest movement in her legs or in her arms pulling the reins, the you, pressure on the horse directs this... Actually, what's a really powerful and potentially quite dangerous animal to do these little steps across an arena and and win prizes and so on. That's the image that James is using here. The tiniest uh, instrument directs a huge thing. Our tongue is a small organ in our body, uh, but controlled, uh, it uh, directs a whole person. Just in in the the rudder and the boat is the same image. It's a positive image, really, isn't it, there, of a ship going where in the right direction or of a horse going in the right direction. The tongue directs it. But what he's saying is your tongue directs the course of your life. That sounds the wrong way round. It sounds as though uh, the course of our life affects our tongue. But James says the other is round. When, When we speak, it directs... It, it forces a direction that we go in. What we say determines what happens in our life. That's why the tongue is so important. The foolish remark, the gossip, the lie, change the direction, the course of our life. We can't get those words back, and the direction is set. Uh, that could be positive. It could be negative. The next image he uses is very negative. Um, It's a spark, isn't it? Now, I've got a niece who rides in North Yorkshire. I've got a 
a sister-in-law and another niece who live in Australia. And they, uh, our niece came to see us in October half-term. And at that point, when she was staying with us, there were bushfires seven miles from her house where her mum was staying. I mean, I, I just found that absolutely terrifying. They were quite chilled about it. They had great confidence in the fire services. And they did escape unscathed, and it didn't get any closer. The fire breaks worked. Uh, but when I was kind of doing a little bit of research on bushfires... Um, I found out that actually sometimes chainsaws or grinders or slashers that are used to control forests can cause bushfires. The tiniest spark from one of those big, well, kind of, you know, tools uh, can create a bushfire. It could be the exhaust from a vehicle can create a bushfire. Uh, A discarded cigarette, these tiny, tiny little things can uh, have the capacity to destroy huge swathes of countryside spark is tiny and it looks weak. Our tongues are small and they seem quite weak, but they can do great damage. It's no wonder that James is repetitive here. He's trying to really enforce upon us this truth that what we say can do damage. What we say sets the course of our lives. Uh, Proverbs 18 is really helpful here. Uh, I forgot which, I haven't written down which verse it is. Um, but God says, a fool's mouth is his undoing. And his lips are a snare to his soul. Saying, a fool's mouth is his undoing. The word you speak foolishly uh, undoes you, sets the course of your life. And his lips are a snare to his soul. Um, Almost the the reverse as well there, that as we speak, our hearts are led astray. It's time to take control of our tongues before our tongues control our lives. Um, And the reason... Why this is urgent is because we will be judged for our loose speech. This, uh, again and again in James, uh, he reminds us that the great judge is listening to our words. Unmerciful words will be treated without mercy, which is a terrifying thought. Um, we see that in, um, in chapter 2 and in chapter 4 and elsewhere as well. Uh, in Four eleven to 12. Have a look at that for a moment. Uh, he says, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you... Who are you to judge your neighbour? In uh, chapter 3, James likens uh, cursing other people to cursing God. uh, And here, to when we slander somebody else, we put ourselves over the law, over God. We condemn God when we condemn other people. That is how serious it is. It is. It's sobering and shocking. And so should it be. And when we think about our media age, when insults are termed funny and comic, um, it's a sobering thought to think about how our culture has been so shaped away from God's word, so uh, has become where insults uh, are acceptable and uh, people compete in them. And... When, so when we, when we sin with our mouths, we condemn God. When we sin with our mouths, we fail to not just love our neighbours as ourselves, but we fail to love God as we should. It's as if our sinful words are a, a, a takeover, a, a power bid, a coup. And I was thinking about the example of David Brainerd, one of the pioneer missionaries to the, uh, to the Indians, thinking about how... Our culture has changed. He was expelled from uh, uh, from university because he said that one of his tutors, uh, Chauncey Whittlesey, which is a great name, uh, had no more grace than a chair. Brainerd was deeply mortified and ashamed uh, for that comment, which lots of Christians today would just laugh off. It's it's a just a light thing. So maybe we need to recapture our consciences about the way we speak, especially about the way we speak about other people. So in this first, first section, we've shown how God tells us to shut up and to pause and to consider. 
But when he does, in James, does encourage us to speak. But the first place to speak is to talk to God. The wise person, we're told in Proverbs, is the one who can hold his or her tongue. Uh, Proverbs 13.3, he who guards his lips guards his life, which is kind of an interesting parallel to the uh, famous proverb, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. There's that, again, that link between lips and heart, between our mouths, what we say and what we feel and believe. But we do have this avenue for speech. Again, it's scattered throughout James. We have to jump around, don't we, because James keeps on going round in circles, coming back to the same ideas. Um, James urges praise and intercession on those who are tempted to complain or argue or boast or lie. But sometimes when we are struggling with somebody else or a situation we're in and we want to mouth off, prayer is the hardest thing to do, but it is the best thing to do. And James gives us real incentives for praying. He tells us to look at Elijah. We're now into uh, chapter 5, aren't we? Uh, he tells us to look at mighty Elijah. He was just... Uh, shall I read that passage? Because I, I left it out earlier because I felt I'd read so much. Let's read it now. Um, let's read from uh, verse 7, chapter 5. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. The Lord, is, the judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no or you will be condemned. Is anyone of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the crops gave rain, and the earth produced its the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So James tells us to look at Elijah. And surprisingly, we know the stories about Elijah, don't we? About Carmel and the drought and the widow. James says Elijah was just like us. He was just like us. Elijah was the righteous man. And we're told that we are like Elijah. We can pray to God and we can expect answers. It's really simple. God does answer prayer. And we can pray. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I find that my prayers are, believed, are prayed, believing God can work, but not connecting that reality with the needs that I've prayed about for years. Both my brother and sister aren't Christians. And praying daily, year after year after year, I separate their need from the reality that God does love to save people. God is compassionate and merciful. There's a disconnect. So I pray out of routine and out of compassion for them, but forget to pray in hope because of our great uh, Father in heaven. Uh, or sometimes our, list, our prayers become a kind of list of, of worry. And so we think we're praying, but actually what we're doing is rehearsing, going over our anxieties again and again. My eldest child was in hospital for a couple of months, and sometimes I realized that my praying was just churning anxiety, going over and over. And it was actually just like talking to a good friend. I was just churning over the anxiety. 
not praying in faith. Now, I'm sure God is compassionate. He has compassion on us when we feel like that. He knows how we are made. He does hear those prayers. But we need to hold on to the hope that we can have, the hope which is based in God's uh, amazing character. Uh, Maybe you noticed as we read that section, uh, we see how, how God is, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, uh, verse 11. We see in James throughout uh, a picture not of a, a, a God who is judge, but a God who loves to show mercy. So what are we to do? We pray, and we pray in hope. Uh, Paul Miller, uh, whose book is in the bookstore, The Praying Life, says, Hope begins with the heart of God. As you grasp what the Father's heart is like, how he loves to give, then prayer will begin to feel completely natural to you. Our prayer starts with God, not with ourselves. Uh, We can pray, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We can pray, Lord, I want to pray, help me to pray. Or we can pray, Lord, I want to want to pray. Sometimes we end up doing that. We don't feel like praying, but we do in our hearts want to be at that point where we want to pray. We pray in verse 15, in faith. And prayer is a corporate activity as well. The elders are to come. And in verse 16, uh, James expands that. He says, confess your sins and pray for each other. Our prayers are individual and they're corporate. As we open our hearts in confession to one another, grumbling disappears. When we confess our sins, when we recognize our weakness, um, we, uh, we see some of those word sins melt away because we're speaking before God and in honesty to each other. Douglas Moo has written a commentary on James, and he, um, he makes a definite link between the trial and the trouble uh, which uh, is uh, mentioned in verse 13, as any one of you in trouble, with the, with the grumbling and the slandering that's going on in the church. So this is a church situation which is riven with uh, slander and criticism, um, but the answer to that is to turn those words as words which are unproductive into productive words, words of prayer. And as we, um, as we pray, we're to pray about the way we speak as well. Um, dashing back to chapter 1 in verse 5, uh, again, James tells us to pray, and he tells us to pray for wisdom. Because God gives generously without finding fault. Aren't those amazing words of comfort? God gives generously without finding fault. We have sins with our words. We can talk to God about those sins. We can ask for wisdom. And we ask for the wisdom, not of needing the right phrase to say. It's not wrong to ask for that. Uh, We may want to ask for a strategy, a way to handle a difficult person. But that's not what God is going to give us specifically uh, look at how he helps chapter 3 verse 13 to 18 Uh, who is wise and understanding among you let him show it by his good life James is talking about the wisdom in chapter 1 he said ask for wisdom God will give you wisdom if you ask him in faith he talks about what wisdom is in these verses here The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. As As we ask God to help us in our speech lives, we ask for wisdom, and he gives us wisdom, which is a godly character. That's what wisdom is, isn't it? Fearing the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We want wisdom. We want to be able to speak properly to our children. We want to speak in a way that's encouraging to members of our Bible study group. We want to be speaking the right way to our husbands to encourage them when they're feeling low and knocked down or when they're angry or struggling with sins. We want wisdom. And the wisdom that God offers that we can ask freely for is the wisdom of a godly character. We don't need to pray, give me wise words. We pray, make me a wise person. Help me to fear you that I might have a heart of wisdom. 
Um, yesterday, I um, talked about the commentary that we run in our heads. Um, so maybe the next step after talking to God is to start talking to ourselves. We listen to ourselves uh, and our unhelpful, self-oriented commentaries that reinforce our double-mindedness, our bitterness, our complaints and our envy. But instead, the Bible teaches us again and again to speak God's word to ourselves. My favourite psalm, and it was read at our wedding, is Psalm 103. It's probably one that you know really well. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. In that psalm, uh, David's saying, telling himself to praise God, isn't he? He's talking, he's preaching to himself. He's telling him, he's listing God's benefits. And that is how we are to talk to ourselves. We need to get rid of the commentary at which we're the center. And when we're thinking again and again and mulling on our own, uh, the injustices of our lives. And instead, we need to refocus and make a commentary, a commentary of praise, of remembering and forgetting not all his benefits. Uh, James has got more, I think I said this yesterday, more imperatives, more commands than any other New Testament books. James tells us how to think. He helps us. He gives us the help, doesn't he? In in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, dear brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. That's the same kind of thing as Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O myself. Consider it. We need to tell ourselves to ourselves. In uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, in uh, Spiritual Depression, um, starts by saying, uh, talking about depression, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why art thou down, cast down? What business do you have to be disquieted? You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, condemn yourself, exhort yourself, and to say to yourself, hope thou in God. That sounds a bit harsh to our kind of therapy culture today, doesn't it? But actually, it's unsurprising that uh, the, the kind of most popular kind of rising form of therapy for people with depression is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And actually, that has quite a lot of common with what Martin Lloyd-Jones has said. He says, if you, if you look into CBT... Uh, It's a system which uh, says don't look back, don't endlessly examine why you're feeling things, but look at how you are now, look at your situation and talk to yourself about it. Now, obviously, there are lots of situations with mental health issues where medicine is really important and useful and intensive therapy is needed. But in our day-to-day lives, where we do get cast down, where we do get uh, ground down, uh, and our narrative is only contributes to that, we need to do what uh, Lloyd-Jones says there. We do need to do what James does and consider it pure joy. Last autumn, my, my father had a, a brain tumour and was, and was dying slowly. And uh, because we were only an hour away, uh, I was privileged to be able to go and visit him regularly. And I had an hour's drive there and back on the M62 on my own in the car, which is, was a real rarity for me. And in those hours, which were really precious, there were time to uh, to sing, or kind of put worship music on to sing, and to uh, pray. And I found God really encouraged me and helped me in those days to consider it pure joy, to say it is well with my soul, to, to say blessed be the name of the Lord, even though I was seeing uh, my dear father get weaker and weaker and weaker. Uh, God's gracious, and when we ask him, he does give us that perspective. He does help us. Though there are low and difficult moments, though it is a struggle, He does give, as we trust his fatherly heart, he does give us hope. And then, uh, last of all, um, we are going to head on to talking to others. I'll try and do this quickly so we have got time for our our discussion. Um, And this is, we're focusing really just on uh, the last verses of the chapter five, just at the end. Uh, We used to... uh, epistles which have those kind of last words uh, messages to people or doxology a uh, list of uh, greetings and and we've got this funny these funny little verses but they have fantastic verses at the end of james if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back remember this whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins 
Isn't that a fantastic encouragement? At the end of a book of words, where there's been hard teaching about how words go wrong, we've got an example and encouragement to use words well. Uh, The antidote to hurtful speech is not silence. Uh, There is prayer, there is listening to other people, but there is speech. Uh, I'm going to skip some bits there. Uh, Proverbs 28 says, uh, 23, He who rebukes a man will in the end gain more favor than he who has a flattering tongue. Or uh, chapter 12, verse 18. I put this on my uh, wall when I was uh, my first teaching job. I thought it was about the only Bible verse that I could get away with because I was in an English classroom. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Um, uh, and Alec Matea says, though we cannot convert them, we must labor to do so. Though we cannot rescue them from death, we must strive for their souls as if their destiny rested with us. Though we cannot cover their sins, we must follow the example of the Son of God who can do so and hold nothing dear to ourselves and no sacrifice too great if only they were saved. We're called to speak the truth in love. Uh, So we face a situation where there's conflict, where there's somebody who's sinning, there's somebody who's hurt us, and we have an opportunity. Do we stay silent or do we speak? And James gives us... uh, encouragement there to speak to speak wisely and speak the truth in love now we do that by starting with listening we listen and listen to where the person is uh, really it's applying what we thought about yesterday where is that person's heart when they speak what are their heart struggles to listen to think carefully uh, because i'm trying to go quickly uh, what we're going to do is look on your handout you should at the bottom have this acrostic which again uh, I pinched uh, from uh, Paul Tripp and it says encourage down the side and if we just run through these really quickly and then the next thing is in the group there's an exercise of things to do which I hope you'll be able to apply these to the scenarios Um, so this is what Paul Tripp's applying kind of all of James putting it together a way to approach people a way to approach potential conflict We start off by examining a heart. We listen to ourselves. Where am I at? Why am I feeling upset or angry by this person? What what is it? Why has this sin needled me? We need to examine our heart and consider where our heart's desires are battling. He says, next, note your calling. I mean, he does twist things to try and get an acrostic out of it. But by that means, he, call, he says we are called, it, uh, what we just read in, in chapter 1, to be peacemakers, aren't we? Uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. We're called to be ambassadors of the gospel, to be peacemakers, to be those who will have, uh, bring about the fruit of righteous lives. So remember our calling. We're not called to, be, to sort everything out. We're not called to, to save somebody, but we are called to be a peacemaker, an ambassador. Check your attitude. Look at where your heart is. Are there sins you need to confess? Uh, are there things you need to deal with, with God, before you talk to somebody? And own your faults. Recognise where you've gone wrong, the things that have led up to this situation that you're facing. What have you done that has contributed to that problem? Then use words wisely. Just be careful, because words are powerful and dangerous. We need to weigh our words. We need to stay away from inflamed and heated and exaggerated words. Um, Hyperbole is easy to fall into it. Exaggeration. We need to be wise. I put reflect off scripture. Of course it should be reflect on scripture. Okay. Consider what scriptures apply to the situation you're in. Consider how Jesus spoke. Think about the Proverbs we've been looking at. Always be prepared to listen. That goes without saying, doesn't it? What is going on in that other person's life? What have they got to say? Maybe they have valid points. They may have expressed them unkindly or hurtfully, but they may well have things you need to learn. Grant time for a response. I think it took me a long time to learn this as a parent. To tell a child to do something, they're struggling in their heart, and you want immediate obedience. And whilst that's good, sometimes we need to give our children a bit of space. We need to give them time to work things out with the Lord and to respond. Sometimes we think our words are magic and they're going to bring about a tremendous response. God tells us in James about perseverance, doesn't he? 
about being steady and careful and giving time. And then we encourage with the gospel. Um, there's not much about the cross. There's not anything about the cross in James, is there? But it's implicit in everything that he says. We need to encourage the people we're speaking with, with the gospel, to remind them that God is loving. He has paid the price for our sins, uh, for whatever conflict and difficulty, that God is a rescuing God. Um, so those, those are kind of practical ways forward. I just wanted to end with a little story. Uh, in fact, it's somebody else's story, so I hope I can remember it properly. Uh, and if you go and read uh, um, War of Words, you'll find the story in there. Um, Paul Tripp tells about uh, early on in his ministry, he, was, um, he had a, a man who was really sapping on him and his wife in the church. There was always something wrong. He was kind of leaped le- from crisis to crisis, and he was very ungrateful for any help that was offered. And it came to a point where this man, uh, he's in America, he went gone to a motel, and he phoned up and said, uh, I think I'm going to take my life. Things are so awful. So Paul Tripp, leaving his young children behind to get in the car and drive to the motel to, do, uh, to confront this suicidal man his wife said I don't think you should go the way you're in I don't think you should go because you're so angry with him um but Paul Tripp said no I need to go because I'm his pastor so he left his wife and his children behind and drove out into the night to talk with this man and when he got there the man just started moaning and Paul Tripp lost it and he shouted at him and he told him how ungrateful he was how self-centered he was uh and uh told him all the things he'd done wrong And feeling, he managed to convince himself that that was the right thing to do. He left, he went home and told his wife what he'd done. And his wife said, you need to go back. He went back and apologised. And the Lord used that apology to work a transformation in that man's life. He started listening um, to other people. It's not right to lose our top, but God can redeem those situations, can't he, where we've lost it. He can redeem and change. And when we start listening and interacting... He is able to work powerfully with people as we apply the gospel to them and as the Holy Spirit works in their lives. So Paul Tripp gets it wrong, but actually God redeems our situations um, and he does his own work in our hearts as well as those people we minister to. So I think think they're quite self-explanatory in the groups. What I've put on the sheet is, uh, I think, four scenarios... Uh, of different, all fictional, uh, uh, fictional scenarios, um, I would suggest that you choose maybe one in your group. Uh, but take the, just like the other you know, sheets, take them home, have a think if you've got time to think about them, and run through the questions, discuss the questions, applying them, and using this acrostic as well uh, to that situation. Okay. Uh, Sarah, shall we come back to sing and... Pray. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.